Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our 19th Inspiration Exchange session. My name is Fergus Imri, and I'll be moderating today's session, and I'm a postdoc in the Van der Schaar lab. Welcome back to everyone who's been to one of our sessions before, and a particularly warm welcome to anybody who may happen to be joining for the first time. Today's topic of our Inspiration Exchange session is an ICML preview from our lab. As always, the ongoing aim of the Inspiration Exchange sessions is to share and explore the breadth of topics in machine learning for healthcare and generate ideas for future research. As I mentioned, today's session is a preview of the ICML accepted work from our group. And today's session will begin with a short introduction from Mahela, outlining the scope of this work and linking it together. We'll then proceed into a series of flash presentations from members of our lab, giving a, just a short teaser into each of these pieces of work before we proceed to a roundtable discussion with our two invited guests for today, which I'll introduce more formally later. After this, we'll open up the, we'll open up the floor to, to a Q&A session for any of our presenters or guests. And please do ask about any of the topics we've presented or anything you might want to know from either of our guests. And please do post your questions in the Inspiration Exchange Slack channel, and the earlier the better. Um, we'll post the link to the Slack channel in the chat shortly, in case you haven't already joined. Great. So without further ado, let me pass over to, to Mahela for a short presentation and overview of our work. So thank you very much, uh, Fergus, and especially thank you very much, uh, Razvan and Ari, for joining us today. Thank you very, very much. Um, let me please, just one second, make sure that, uh, okay. So usually when we have these inspiration exchanges, we are focusing on a particular area. For instance, in the last two sessions, we focused on causal deep learning. But today we decided to tell you about various things we have recently done and show to you how they fit together in a hope to paint a picture about the exciting area of machine learning for healthcare. So on that note, I often say that our goal is to develop tools from machine learning to move medicine from art to science. And our goal in the lab is to deliver bespoke medicine, going beyond personalized medicine, understand basis and trajectories of health and disease, empower healthcare professionals and patients, inform and improve clinical pathways, better utilization of resources and reducing costs, transform population health and public health policies, and enable new discoveries. And indeed, we work with clinicians such as Ari, who is going to join us later, to really make this transformation in healthcare. But this is, of course, a very hard road, and we will discuss about the potential of this work in healthcare. However, I also would like to highlight that medicine is really a very powerful area to inspire cutting-edge machine learning. I have worked in other areas before focusing on machine learning for healthcare, but I really can say that medicine is really pushing me and my team to develop this cutting edge machine learning research. So I find it a very exciting area, not only a very impactful area. So the different work that we are doing and we are going to present to you today falls in four different categories. First, there is the work that relates to the data. Because unless we have data, we cannot do any analytics and any machine learning for healthcare. But of course, the availability of data in healthcare is scarce due to privacy considerations. And also the data sets are often relatively small. So an important area in which machine learning can help is by using generative models to build synthetic data sets that can then be used by researchers in machine learning to develop analytics. One of the papers that we are not going to highlight today, but which was highlighted in a previous inspiration exchange, relates to synthetic data. Another topic that is very powerful is assessing the quality of the data that is fed on the various analytics 
and the impact it plays in developing this analytics. And today we are going to talk about that. I'm highlighting in yellow the works that we are going to talk about and in white the ones that we are working on our lab but are not going to be highlighted today. Then on the basis of this data, we are building analytics. For instance, automated machine learning frameworks, methods for estimating individualized treatment effects, causal deep learning, time series forecasting, as well as many other analytics, inclusively missing data. And again, today you will see a variety of works that are highlighted here in yellow. But for healthcare to really capitalize on these analytics, we need not only to have accurate predictions, but we also need to have methods that are interpretable. Hence, the clinicians and patients can use the information that's extracted using these analytics in a way that it is in the understandable, explainable, and trustworthy. And finally, be able to make new discoveries on the basis of this analytics. An important and often overlooked area of machine learning for healthcare is the fact that we do not want to replace clinicians, but rather empower them. So we need to build an ecosystem, a human-machine partnership. So another piece of the puzzle, and this represents, I would say, a new frontier in machine learning, is using machine learning to augment human skill. And you are going to hear about that as well today. So without further ado, let me start by highlighting the first paper we are going to discuss today, and that is by Nabil and Jonathan, and it's called Data Suite. And the focus of this work is to build a data-centric framework to identify incongruous regions of in-distribution data. And the reason this is exciting for us is that in healthcare, we often deal with a variety of data with different types of qualities. And what is really important is to make sure that we understand the quality of this data to help data owners understand the limitations and the impact that these data limitations has on the model deployment. Nabil, the floor is yours. So hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nabil Sirat. I'll be presenting Data Suite, where we look at data-centric identification of in-distribution in Congress examples. And this is joint work with Jonathan Krabe and Mihaela van der Shah. So as we all know, machine learning models fundamentally rely on the data, both at training time and when we evaluate models. And this is fundamentally important when we start deploying these models in mission critical areas, such as healthcare. And as we all know, the adage goes that if we start feeding machine learning models garbage, we probably are going to get garbage out on the other side. And the machine learning community has tried to mitigate this issue by trying to do a lot of out of distribution detection. And this is a fundamentally important problem. However, in this paper, we tackle a much less studied but equally important problem of how do we actually assess in distribution data which might have heterogeneity in the feature space. And by this we mean we actually might have common support, but we actually might have poor coverage in certain regions or certain biases. And we want to understand how does this affect the machine learning model. And to anchor ideas, imagine we have two real data scientists, Alice and Bob, that need our help at a variety of stages in the pipeline where we have Alice at the beginning stage who really just wants to understand the data and understand regions of uncertainties and inconsistencies, both to understand limitations of data, but to also guide future data collection. On the other hand, we have Bob who actually has a trained machine learning model F star and wants to understand for new testing points, when can these predictions actually be trusted? And current machine learning focuses primarily on the second use case being largely model dependent. And hence we can't naturally address the first use case around data exploration at the same time. And Data Suite is a paradigm shift which attempts to address this. But before getting into that, let's look at what current approaches do. So current approaches actually model predictive uncertainty and aim to estimate when a model should be confident in making an actual prediction. And we call this model-centric uncertainty. And the reason for this is methods such as Bayesian neural networks, quantile regression, and the like are largely model dependent in the way we flag examples. 
However, in data suite, we take a completely different approach and we model uncertainty in the actual data values themselves, and particularly modeling uncertainty in the feature values, which we call data-centric uncertainty. And the fundamental benefit of this approach is that it allows us to surface or identify instances which are impactful in a model independent manner, such that any of these instances identified should be impactful for any downstream machine learning model. And we'd like you to keep this idea of model independence in mind as we progress through this presentation. But this is obviously a non-trivial task to do, and we need some principled goals for this. So in Data Suite, we built feature-wise confidence interval estimators, and we use these estimators to characterize new test instances based on a set of training instances. And the goal is to produce a characterization of the data set like I've just shown on the screen right now. But we need some properties for this, and we encourage you to read the paper to look at these properties in more depth. But the first is we want to provide coverage guarantees, which many methods don't provide. We want our intervals to be feature-wise, such that we can trace the uncertainties to actual features in the data. And we want them to be adaptive at an instance level such that we can actually order data points within a data set. And finally, we want the intervals to be decoupled from the downstream model such that we can identify instances independent of said model. But how does Data Suite do this? We start with a generator which makes use of copula modeling to produce an augmented version of our data set. Beyond just augmenting the data set, it allows us to no longer even need the training data set in the event that model that data sharing is an issue. We then use this augmented set and learn a representation function. And based on this representation, we use a conformal predictor to actually produce these actual confidence intervals that we've spoken about in the previous slide. I encourage you to look at each of these individual sections in more depth in the paper. However, we just want to highlight two key areas. The first is the non-traditional non-conformity score for conformal predictor. In this case, we use a normalized version in order to produce adaptiveness. And this allows us to actually produce intervals which adapt based on the difficulty of the data instance. And once we have these intervals, we can then flag instances as both uncertain and inconsistent based on the size of these guaranteed confidence intervals. But now when we have these intervals, what can we actually do with them? And Data Suite enables reliable model deployment because we A, provide confident usage, we provide one minus alpha coverage guarantees, which are both theoretically and experimentally shown. But additionally, Data Suite improves downstream performance. We show that our stratification improves model performance compared to our model centric counterparts. And we do this in a manner which is independent of the downstream model because we show that we find consistently impactful instances for a diverse class of downstream machine learning models. Additionally, Data Suite enables insightful data exploration. As you can see, the certain and uncertain groups in green and red represent two different demographic groups. And this can allow practitioners to actually understand the limitations of their data set, where there are regions which might be problematic and how they perhaps could improve this in the future. In conclusion, Data Suite, we tackle this understudy problem of in-distribution heterogeneity, and we take a data-centric paradigm shift compared to the model-centric approach. And besides taking this paradigm shift, we actually even outperform model-centric counterparts. We can identify impactful instances independent of a downstream predictive model. And fundamentally, we think we provide a useful tool for practitioners who can use this tool to do some good work, but also confidently use it because of our rigorous theoretical guarantees. We encourage you, please, to engage with our paper, and most importantly, to engage with this data-centric agenda. Thank you. Um, and the next, the next paper is called Hyperimpute. And I'm really excited about this paper because it's a very powerful framework for imputation. And this is work by Bogdan, Dan, Tennyson, and Arisha. And um, I'm excited about it because imputation is a problem that is often overlooked yet there are relatively few powerful solutions that work for diverse data sets. Yet missing data is a very ubiquitous problem in many scenarios. And what's nice about this framework is not only that the solution is very good, but also um, the students have worked hard to have a very practical software package 
uh, that really can be used by all of you easily. So Alicia is going to present this work. Alicia, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, my name is Alicia, and I will be presenting our paper Hyperimpute, or Generalized Iterative Imputation with Automated Model Selection. Um, this project was led by, led by Dan Jarrett and Bogdan Tibera, uh, and co-authored by myself, Tennyson Louis, and uh, Mihela. And we are motivated by the fact that, as Mihela just said, missing data is indeed a ubiquitous problem in real-life data collection, uh, almost regardless of the application that you're considering. Um, but as we are motivated by medical um, applications, there's often the problem of unrecorded patient characteristics, missing lab values, et cetera. The goal that we are uh, following is that we want to know the likely values um, of a data set, uh, regardless of the downstream task. So here we're doing imputation, regardless of uh, the actual task, for example, risk prediction or something else. Um, and we want to impute all values, even when no columns um, are complete. Much interest uh, in the machine learning work and in the recent machine learning literature has given, been given to imputation recently. Um, and there are two streams uh, of literature that we wanna um, point out here. Um, existing work usually relies either on iterative imputation, uh, sometimes also referred to imputation by chained equation, which uses correctly pre-specified per column kind of prediction models uh, where a single uh, column is imputed conditional on all others, um, or uses deep generative models. Uh, for example, gain or miracle um, that have been produced by our own lab recently um, as joint models for all features. So all features are imputed jointly in these models. Different methods um, appear to do well across different data sets and settings. Um, as you can see here in this plot where we have different data sets um, on the x-axis, uh, so we'd really like to create a new solution that automatically performs well in any scenario. For our solution, we came up with three desiderata that we would like it to fulfill. Um, on the one hand, we would like our solution to work under the weakest assumptions possible. So we would like it to be trainable without complete data, um, but also not assume um, completely at random missingness patterns. Uh, we would like our solution to be flexible. Uh, so to combine the flexibility of conditional specifications with the capacity of deep approximators, and we want it to be easily optimizable. That is, we want to relieve the burden of having to specify a model completely, and we want it to be easily and automatically optimizable or tunable. In our paper, we propose hyperimpute, a generalized iterative imputation approach. Um, and we chose for uh, iterative imputation because we believe it's the best way to fulfill our desiderata. Because with iterative imputation, uh, we have weak assumptions as we allow a very generic missing at random setting. Uh, we have flexibility because it allows specifying different models for each column and can easily incorporate different data types per column and other design specifics, for example, bounds on the variables that are missing. Um, and we have easy optimization because a column-wise kind of predictive perspective gives a simple evaluation criterion for every single column model. However, uh, because we take a per column perspective, the search space of models, of per column models, is of course combinatorial in the number of columns, um, which makes optimization more difficult. If we were to perform some kind of a top-down search across all combinations of per column models, that would be intractable as soon as we have more than a few features that are missing. On the, if we wanted to make our life simpler, we could just perform a concurrent search. So to find a predictive model for each column in parallel, but that would clearly be suboptimal. Therefore, our hyperimpute approach um, uses an iterative model search approach where we iterate over the different columns while looking for new models. So let me give you a quick overview of how hyperimpute operates. Given some currently baseline imputed data set, we want to find the best model for the next column D. For, for doing this, we use the records, uh, for only the records for which this target variable is observed. And then we perform some kind of model search. Our framework is very um, modular. So we allow any kind of auto ML solution for the model search. Uh, in our experiments, we use hyperband. Um, and then we use the observed data and 
this model search algorithm to search over all possible predictive models to impute um, to impute observations of this class, for example, linear models, neural networks, or boosting methods. Having found this best model, we use it to impute the missing targets, and then we update the data set and iterate over all columns. This, uh, our paper comes with a Python package, which we hope will be a useful tool for any practitioner that uh, is faced with missing data. It's implemented as an easy to use modular SK learn style package and even includes other baselines and evaluation tools. In our empirical investigations, we show that hyperimpute outperforms existing baselines across different data sets and different missingness mechanisms. And we also show that uh, hyperimpute allows us to find interesting new insights into what kind of model classes are selected as we, for example, vary the missingness rate. Things such as sources of gain, converg convergence, and other scenario analysis are covered in the full paper. And we hope that you check out the paper and more importantly, check out and try out the code which is available um, on our GitHub. And thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much to all our sponsors for making this possible. Still in the data agenda, but we are not going to discuss today because we have discussed it into a previous session. There is work on synthetic data generation and maybe more excitingly, trying to assess the quality of synthetic data. So when we started our work on synthetic data seven years ago, very few people were working on it, but now many people are generating synthetic data. So the next question we would like to ask is how faithful is the synthetic data? And Ahmed, Boris and Evgeny have done work in this area and you can read about it, but also you can see a previous inspiration exchange about it. Let us now move to analytics. And there I'm going to start with Neural Laplace, which is learning diverse classes of differential equations in the Laplace domain. And this is work by Sam and Zhaoji. And what is really interesting about this work is that we know and love neural ODEs, but we also know that neural ODEs are inadequate to model systems with long range dependencies or discontinuities. So what has happened in this work is providing a unified framework to go beyond that and learn differential equations that govern dynamical systems beyond the ones that neural ODEs can. And does that while achieving superior performance in modeling and extrapolating the trajectories of various classes of differential equations? Sam. Welcome everyone, I'm Samuel Holt. I'll be presenting Neuroplast today, learning diverse classes of differential equations in the Laplace domain. This is joint work with, um, with my excellent co-authors, Zhaji Quain and Mahela van der Schaaf. So learning differential equations that govern dynamic systems is of great practical interest in the natural and social sciences. Chen et al. in 2018 introduced the ordinary differential equation, which some of us are familiar with, to model temporal states according to how an ordering differential equation evolves, where the function f is unknown a priori and is learned by a neural network. However, there exist many broader classes of differential equations for which neural OD cannot model or describe, as we see here. These different equations can be formulated to capture more general temporal dynamics, which are beyond an OD's modeling capacity. For example, delay differential equations, integral differential equations, and forced differential equations, particularly when we have historical dependency on the previous states, or we might have new forcing functions or other additional terms. So we, we, the principle of this work, Neural Plus, was to learn and model solutions for differential equation systems in the Laplace domain, and actually determine these in a data-driven way from observed trajectories. Now, this has many advantages, most principally that multiple class differential equations can be represented and solved in the Laplace domain, and this bypasses numerical OD solvers and constructs the time solution with global summations of complex exponentials. So our overall framework consists of three main components. Looking at a typical extrapolation system where we observe part of a trajectory and we want to learn the flow or the differential equation that determines the underlying system to then extrapolate at future time points. 
we would actually encode the observed trajectories into a latent initial state vector P. We would then use this to construct a Laplace representation and use an inverse Laplace transform to determine and evaluate the trajectory at future time points of our interest. The encoder uses a neural network, in this case, a uh, gated recurrent neural network, and actually can determine observations at irregular times to encode the initial state into a latent state vector. We can then feed this latent state vector into a parameterized functional Laplace representation representing the differential equation solution. Now, if we were to do and solve differential equations analytically with the Laplace transform method, we normally get a Laplace representations of a fractional form, as we can see here. Now, this is quite difficult because often fractional forms have singularity points, points that tend to infinity. Now, approximating this to neural network is quite tricky. Therefore, our paper introduces the concept of mapping this onto a Riemann stereographic projection sphere, where mapping the whole complex domain into a simple closed form compact set, in this case, onto a sphere for each dimension in a complex domain to be modeled. And we instead model the Laplace representation function on a sphere instead, and then use this, represent this projection to then map it for the whole complex domain. Once we have a Laplace representation function of the differential equation system, we can then use an inverse Laplace transform method. Now, this normally comes in two parts where we have a set of query points for a time evaluated t, and then we can evaluate fs at these time points, at these set of s points to then reconstruct the reconstruction at xt. Most notably, actually, the Laplace representation is independent of the time value t. This means we can actually reconstruct at any time point with just one single pass through the network, which is much superior to neural ODE methods, which you normally have to iterate uh, and the numerical ODE silver many times to get to a time point. So how does this work in experiments? Looking at the Mackey-Glass delay differential equation system, where the historical dependencies actually have an impact on the future evolution of the trajectory, we see Neuroplast actually outperforms other benchmark competing methods. And across a broad range of delayed differential equations, integral differential equations, stiff differential equation systems for extrapolation, test, root mean squared error, Neuroplast outperforms other competing benchmarks. So it also has less number of forward evaluations for extrapolating to a future time point most principally, we only have one future uh, number of forward evaluation through the network compared to neural ODE models, which actually have to iterate to get to a forward evaluation time. And it scales linearly in the number of time points to evaluate within a fixed interval of time. So the main contributions are that we can learn diverse classes of different equations by modeling in the plus domain. It can reconstruct any trajectory at any time point with one pass through the network. And it scales linearly with the number of time points to evaluate whilst modeling diverse classes of differential equation systems better than their existing methods. For more information, please see the QR code for the paper and or more time series papers on our lab's website. The code for the paper is also included in the paper as well. Great, and I hope you find this useful. Thank you, Sam. So uh, in view of time, I'm going to, to be a little bit faster with the introductions. The next uh, paper is on continuous time modeling of counterfactual outcomes. Uh, and the focus here is going to estimate counterfactual outcomes over time. And what's interesting about this paper is that it's trying to do so um, in a setting where we typically observational data is irregularly sampled, like often is the case in healthcare with inconsistent sampling times across patients. And this work is by Nabil, Fergus, Alexis, and Jaoji, and will be presented by Fergus. 
Great. Thank you, Mihaela. And I'm really excited to be presented, presenting our work on counterfactual um, outcome estimation in continuous time. And as Mihaela mentioned, this is joint work with Nabil Sidat and together with our co-authors, Alexis Bella, Zhaji Chen and Mihaela. So let us begin with an example. And, and let us take a patient who has lung cancer. And we observe a series of measurements and past treatments for this patient. The key question we want to answer is we want to be able to infer what might happen next for this patient under a future sequence of treatments. We'd like to do this for multiple different treatment paths, be this not treatment, treating, or administering a different set of treatments, so that doctors can begin to answer the what-if style questions of when to treat, how to treat, and, and when to treat. So existing work was limited to fixed regular time intervals between observations. However, observations are typically not at regular time intervals in the type of real world data available to us um, from, from real world healthcare systems such as hospitals. But instead, both, both the patient history and the future treatment plans are observed irregularly. And we'd like to be able to assess arbitrary future treatment plans where the treatment times might be at any time point in the future. So the key question for our work becomes, how can we learn from such irregular observation patterns? So our solution is the treatment effect neural controlled differential equation, or TECDE for short. And the key idea of our work is to learn a continuous latent representation of the patient state as a solution to a controlled differential equation. So our method works as follows. We first encode observations up to a time t um, and learn a continuous latent path z as a solution to a controlled differential equation. Then for a future treatment plan that a doctor wishes to assess, we can decode future treatments and update the latent state for the patient using a second controlled differential equation. Then finally, we can predict counterfactual outcomes from this latent state. One key challenge in, mod in modeling treatment effects over time is that of time-dependent compounding, which can bias the treatment assignment in the observational cohort. So just very briefly, time-dependent confounding occurs when patient covariates are affected by past treatment decisions, which then, which then impacts the future values of those covariates and future treatment decisions and outcomes. And in our work, we address this via domain adversarial training. So since it's not possible to observe counterfactuals, we require a simulation environment in which to test both our method and other methods. For the underlying dynamics of our simulation environment, we use the lung cancer tumor growth model of Geng et al, which models tumor growth with, with two treatment options, either chemotherapy or radiotherapy. We then create a flexible simulation environment by introducing a continuous time observation process parameterized by a Hawkes process. And the Hawkes process has two key, two key features that are very helpful in this simulation environment. The first is that it's self-exciting, which means that if we've recently observed the patient state, we're more likely to observe the patient state in a short period of time in the future. And the second is that the Hawkes process is, can be state dependent. And in our simulations, we base the state on the um, American Joint Committee on Cancers cancer staging so that we can model the behavior where patients with more severe cancer are observed more frequently than those, than those with more mild disease. So across, the, across a range of scenarios in this simulation environment, we show that our method TECD outperforms state-of-the-art discrete time baselines, CRN and RMSN. In addition, we demonstrate the importance of domain adversarial training in this environment by comparing a, to a version of our method which doesn't, which, doesn't, which doesn't use this. And finally, we demonstrate the utility of our method, both for counterfactual estimation but perhaps more importantly for the downstream, um, for downstream effects, 
but we also demonstrate our method's usefulness for correctly predicting the correct treatment to give a patient. So to briefly summarize our contributions, we've extended counterfactual estimation over time to the irregularly sampled setting and introduced a simulation environment for irregularly sampled observations that's medically motivated and we believe realistic. In addition, we propose TECD as a solution, modeling for the first time a patient's latent trajectory as a solution to a controlled differential equation. And we demonstrate the utility of our approach, both counterfactual estimation and treatment accuracy. If you're interested in finding out more, please do check out our paper. And in addition, we've open sourced both the code and our simulation environment for future researchers to use. Finally, on behalf of all the authors, I'd like to thank our, um, our funders for this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fergus. Um, well, now we discussed analytics. The next um, stage is how can we make the output of such analytics useful, transparent, and explainable? And this is what is the subject of the next talk on label-free explainability for unsupervised models by Jonathan. And the reason I like this work is that most of the work on interpretability and explainability so far has focused on um, turning the predictive models into white boxes. So trying to interpret uh, supervised models. Yet in this work, we use label-free explainability to make unsupervised models interpretable, which was not possible before. Hello, everybody. My name is Jonathan Kaber. I'm a PhD student at the Van der Sier Lab. And today, I'm very happy to present my work that I called Label-Free Explainability for Unsupervised Models. Let us start with a bit of context. We'll quickly review how we typically explain the predictions of supervised models. We start with, with an input, here an image, that we feed to a black box model. Here, the black box wants to predict if there is a cat or a dog on the picture. Now, we want to interpret the predictions of this black box. To do that, we need to select a scalar output from the black box. The typical approach to do so is to use the ground truth label to select a suitable probability. Then we can simply use a feature importance method to compute, uh, to attribute importance to each of the feature for this probability. We then obtain a science map highlighting the most relevant parts of the image according to the model. This is the idea behind most feature importance methods like integrated gradients, for instance. Of course, feature importance methods are not the only one around. Let's now see how example importance methods like influence functions work. The idea here is that we use both probabilities together with a label to compute a loss, such as the cross entropy loss, for instance. We then compute the gradient of this loss with respect to the model's parameters. By doing the same for all the training examples, we can dig up related examples that have similar gradients. These examples with similar gradients are considered to be the most influential one according to the model. Now that we have discussed the typical interpretability setting, let us transition to something more challenging. We will try to interpret the predictions of a model that was obtained through unsupervised learning. In the most standard setting, we have an encoder that provides a representation of the data. Here, both of the neurons are scalar functions of the input. I can backpropagate both of them to obtain two saliency maps. But wait, how do I know which features are the most salient for the encoder to assign this representation as a whole? Since I do not have access to an external label, there is no obvious way for me to choose between these two saliency maps. When it comes to example importance, the absence of label is also problematic because there is no obvious way for me to compute a loss. Both of these considerations motivate a new type of explainability that does not require any label. We call this label-free explainability. Let us now focus on label-free feature importance. How do I combine these two saliency maps here? Well, I start by noting that these two functions, f1 and f2, typically correspond to neuron activations. Therefore, we propose to weigh each saliency map according to the corresponding neuron activation. You can convince yourself that this also makes sense for linear combinations of neurons. In the paper, we show that this definition guarantees a completeness property, which is a big deal for feature importance methods. 
Finally, we show that this expression is also invariant with respect to orthogonal transformations of the representation space. Hence, two representation space with the same geometry will lead to the same feature importance. Let us now focus on label-free example importance. The challenge here is to compute a loss without label. Well, often encoders are not trained by themselves. You typically have a decoder that will reconstruct the original input. This reconstructed input can be compared to the original input through a loss. Again, we can compute the gradient of this loss with respect to the encoder's parameters. Note that the gradient here is only with respect to the encoder's parameters. This is because our focus is to explain the representation learned by this encoder. By doing this for all the training examples, we can again dig up examples with similar gradients. In this way, we can find important examples without any label. In our experiments, we validate the label-free methods in a wide variety of settings. First, you can notice that I did not specify any feature importance or example importance method so far. This is because label-free explainability is really a wrapper that can be used around any existing feature or example importance method. On top of that, we demonstrate that the resulting interpretation method gives sensible results for a wide variety of unsupervised models. Since our framework works for a wide variety of models, it can be used to compare them. We illustrate this with a use case where we compare the representations learned by various encoders. Finally, we explore the interpretability of these entangled VAEs. In particular, we show that the saliency maps of those models often exhibit surprising results. There are many things I omitted in this short talk. For all of these details and more, of course, I invite you to read the paper. I really hope you enjoyed the talk. And if you want more information, please follow one of the two links here. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. This brings us to the last presentation today, um, which really tries to build this human-machine partnership for empowerment and augmenting human skills. And this is entitled Inverse Contextual Bandits, Learning How Behavior Evolves Over Time. And the focus here is to offer a quantitative and interpretable account of how clinical practice evolves over time. And this is crucial for designing better guidelines. And this is work by Alihan and Dan, and we present, we presented by Alihan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present our work titled Inverse Contextual Bandits. It is about learning how behavior evolves over time. And this paper has very much to do with policy learning. In its most general sense, policy learning is about determining an agent's policy, how they behave, given only observations from their behavior. And the common limitation with policy learning is that uh, conventional methods such as inverse reinforcement learning usually assumes behavior is stationary when inferring the agent's policy. But uh, as you might imagine, human decision making is rarely stationary. It constantly evolves as humans learn more about their environments. And that's the problem we want to answer in this paper. How can we? Just by looking at how someone has behaved, how can we say, how did their behave, like can we formalize how did their behavior changed over time? <laughs> As a motivating example of this, we use organ allocation. Uh, is the clinical understanding of how liver transplantations occur uh, has evolved through research. So did uh, liver allocation policies, how a newly arriving organ might be assigned to a new patient has also changed. And then the natural question, of course, is as these policies has been updated, did the actual uh, allocation practices they were supposed to control, uh, did they also evolve with them as well? And we believe that providing a quantitative and interpretable representation of how actual behavior has evolved is kind of the first necessary step that evaluating the impact of such guidelines. Here's, for instance, kind of like a stylized example of this. Suppose for a clinical decision, the standard is to look at uh, some feature C first. And 
later on some clinical research reveals that actually feature A and feature P are better indicators for the decision in question. So at time T0, a new guideline is introduced, kind of trying to promote this new feature as the basis of decisions. Using a method like this, we can kind of obtain a representation of how the importance of these features have evolved over time. And maybe we can see that while feature A has gained importance after the introduction of those guideline, feature B didn't, but it was intended that it would also gain importance. So now having made these observations, maybe the designers of this guideline can iterate again and kind of improve their guideline to also promote the importance of feature B. So in this paper, we kind of consider the standard decision-making setup. Uh, the agent observes a context relating to their environment and according to their internal understanding, their internal belief about how their environment operates, they take an action. And as a result of their action, uh, some sort of outcome is observed and the agent then assigns kind of an internal value to that outcome, which we certainly do not know of because it's internal to the agent itself. And then using that reward, they then update their belief about how their environment evolves because now they have seen an additional outcome. And meanwhile, also according to this action, the environment kind of transitions into a new state and a new context arrives and the decision maker takes a new action and so on. And in this setup, inverse contextual bandits is simple the problem of determining what these internal beliefs might be solely given the observations of context and actions generated by this behavior. Crucially, without knowing any of the internal rewards assigned to the outcomes of these actions. And as a start, as an initial first step, we only consider this problem under independent transitions, where transition into next context doesn't really depend on the actions of the agent. Before I move on, it's kind of important to uh, mention that this specific kind of problem, this objective is tailored towards describing past behavior. Because like this full belief trajectory kind of gives a overall overview of how the behavior has occurred in the past. There is a more traditional kind of objective in apprenticeship learning it could be to just in, uh, infer how the rewards are assigned by the agent to the outcomes, which would be indicative of what they ultimately want to achieve in this environment if they were to fully know how it operates. Again, this is not our objective, though our objective has to do with it has to do more with explaining how behavior has occurred, not what the behavior should be. And there is, we uh, propose two different algorithms to kind of tackle this objective. And they make various assumptions in, in terms of their strength. The first one assumes uh, the agent update, updates their beliefs about the environment in a Bayesian way. While the second one assumes it's just a smooth kind of, the belief trajectories are smooth. So the agent doesn't suddenly change their mind. And it's a bigger assumption. In both cases, we relate how the actions are selected to these belief trajectories, and then uh, use this relation to sample belief trajectories conditioned on the observed data using uh, Marco Monte Carlo methods. We applied our methods to uh, liver transplantation data from the US. Here's a snapshot of the liver allocation policies in two different years in the US. One is from 2000, one is from 2010. And as you can see, uh, between the two, INR has gained significant importance. INR is a feature uh, related to blood circulation. It's uh, measured using blood tests. And we actually know that this is a consistent change because we know that in 2002, a new level allocation pulse called MELD was introduced, 
And INR is one of the primary kind of factors that goes, goes into malpalsy. And here's a more general overview of how these allocation behaviors have evolved continuously. And similar to the previous example, we see that in almost all significant changes align nicely with some update to deliver policies. And if you wanna learn more about this project, please take a look at our paper and also please see our other related work on modeling behavior in different settings in our website. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alihan, and thank you to all of the speakers um, today. So we'll now move to our industry panel, and I'd like to introduce our guests briefly. Um, but first, I do want to say that we regret that um, Dr. Sarah Abjori from Babylon is unable to join us today um, for an urgent personal reason. But I'm delighted to introduce our two guests, Dr. Um, Razwan Pashkanu, who is a research scientist at DeepMind, and Dr. Ari Erkel, who is a consultant and researcher in anesthesia intensive care at the University of Cambridge. Without further ado, I want to pass over to Mihaela, who will be chairing the, the panel session today. And I believe the first set of questions are for Razvan. So thank you very much, Razvan and Ari, for joining us. And apologies for the bad time management. We are running somewhat late, so sorry for that. So Razvan, my first questions are to you. Fergus, maybe you will let them appear one by one. So my first question, Razvan, is which of these machine learning methods presented today you think would be particularly intriguing or impactful and why? Right. Um, uh, so f thank you so much for having me. For, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thank you for that. Um, I think all of the presented works are interesting, and the fact that they got accepted to, to ICML, it's uh, you know, uh, it's a sign that that's the case. Um, and then my answer is obviously biased. Uh, I mean, this, you know, there, there are different reasons why you might be interested in all of this. So for me, the one thing that stood out was the the neural La Laplace um, uh, paper, and that's just because it, it's something that I'm also kind of interested uh, myself. Which is, um, I think we we reached a point, um, at least in in terms of architecture design. In, in machine learning, where we need to find interesting ways to add inductive biases in the architectures. Um, and, you know, that there is like a, in physics, this is like a big topic, or like if you want to model some physical system and you know that there's some properties, like it needs to conserve energy or something like that, like how do you reduce your search space by adding these kind of things? And I, and I think this work on, on neural Laplace um, approximations kind of fit in, in that space because it is sort of a way of like, okay, we know something about ODEs, we know sort of extension about ODEs, and, and how do we uh, incorporate those as well? Um, so, so in that sense, I, I, I find that quite exciting. Um, another work that I um, uh, that I find interesting is uh, is the da data uh, uh, shoot, the, so the first work that was presented, and there's just, um, I mean, I, I okay, so I'm I'm not convinced about the the data centric view. To a certain degree, as in, I, I believe um, it can be dangerous to ignore the model when you're trying to ask these questions. Um, you you kind of get sort of like a worst case scenario, or potentially you might be going for a worst case scenario um, when when you're looking and, and not taking the model into consideration. But I think the topic is extremely important. I think uh, as machine learning as a, as a as a field grows, I think understanding the relationship between the data and the models that we learn and the interaction between these things is becoming more and more important. And um, I mean, moving away from, from, from the kind of works uh, you're doing, like in, in, in general, sort of in the large scale, like, you know, language modeling and stuff like this, we reached a point where it becomes more and more hard to talk about train test, uh, train test uh, data set. So, you know, it, it becomes hard to know what's out of distribution, what's in distribution. So I think any further works that are trying to understand um, you know, the relationship between data, like if you get a test point, how does this compare to the training set where, you know, questions about coverage of the space and stuff like this. Um, I, I think these are topics that are going to become more and more important. And 
potentially that they will be folded in also how we evaluate the systems, which I think sort of the, the test evaluation that we're doing right now, it's so we're at a point where it might be starting to fail and we need to find other ways to think of how we understand what the system has learned, you know, where can we trust it, why can we trust it and stuff like that. So, um, and I find that work like, you know, interesting because it does a step in that direction and pro provides this sort of new ways of, of or looking at that, um, but yeah. Otherwise, like I think all, all the other, uh, yeah, all the other papers are, are quite interesting. Thank you, Razvan. Um, this is important to us because at times in academia, one forgets what's important in industry. So a second question kind of relates to this a little bit. So, what is your advice with respect to ingredients that are needed for ML research to have a long-lasting impact? not only in academia, but also in industry? Yeah, um, so it, it, it's a great question and it's, it's a difficult question to answer. I, I think there are two parts to this. So um, one thing that I would say is research has a strong social component. Uh, so one important aspect of it is communication. Um, so like how, how well the paper is written, how well is motivated, it's sometimes as important as the actual scientific content because um, your goal is to try to communicate something and to try to get the community excited about sort of what you've done and, and understand very quickly. So, um, you know, like uh, people complain that maybe reviewers don't spend a lot of time reading a paper, but at the same time, you should write a paper assuming that some people can only spend five minutes looking at it. And in those five minutes, they need to understand what you're trying to say. Um, so I think, yeah, communication is a, is a big part of it. Um, the other big part of it is um, just, it, it, you need to find, it, one needs to find a really fine balance between long-term and short-term uh, perspective on the research that you're doing. So um, I, I see often people that get stuck into like uh, minute details of, sort of the, you know, like talking about learning grade schedules and stuff like that, that for some people feel like the, the quite detailed aspects of it. Um, obviously they're crucial. Um, like you can't really get system to work without getting these things right. But when you write the paper, when you do your research, you, you need to think of like, hey, how can this research project that I'm doing, how can it grow and how can I present it in such a way that people understand um, how it can be applied in many different places, right? Maybe I'm working on like a computer vision thing, but I want to know if my ideas are applicable to NLP, are applicable to RL, are apl applicable somewhere else, and try to present them in a way and explain why they could be applied um, uh, somewhere else. Um, the other things that I would say, yeah, like I think also being quite frank about limitations is important and it's important from multiple reasons. In one, one way it's important is if you're open about where your, your work fell short and where it can be improved, it gives other people who read the paper an idea of where to continue, <laughs> right? So if you present things like this is done, there's nothing to be done, you know, I've, I finished everything, this is just working, then people don't need to build on your work. It's, it's done, they, they can just use it. So you want to be upfront of like how you could uh, improve it. And I think that's something people don't do as, it, it's been a tradition in deep learning, at least, to kind of just present as this is the best thing ever and it's just finished and it works. And I think it was just because initially at the, when, when the field started to grow, um, new nets weren't well seen. So we we're trying to like pump up our work as much as we can and say, oh, it's worked so well. But I think we got to a point where the best strategy is exactly the opposite one, it's being as frank as possible of where the limitations are um, and how this paper could grow. And yeah, hope that people would find that interesting and, and, and build. Um, and then also like uh, another thing people don't normally do as much is being consistent. Like if you publish the work and can be improved, if you do a follow up work, that's important. Like, you know, consistency, you can't just do a paper and then just hope someone else will pick it up and expand it for you. Um, yeah, and I guess finally, there is always an element of luck <laughs> that we shouldn't ignore. So um, sometimes papers get ignored, even if they're written the right way and they have the right content. It's it's a big field, there's lots of papers, so um, yeah, there's also noise that... Thank you very way. much, uh, Razvan. Fergus, maybe one final question for Razvan. So what advice do you have for academic researchers like us and for students 
to make a true impact in ML. But I guess that this is something you kind of already addressed. So yeah. I don't know whether briefly you have anything else, but maybe I, I, I run to the next one, the final one. Do you think that, um, again, students and academic researcher like us, how should we best interact with machine learning researchers in the industry like you and DeepMind and other such research organizations? Um, yeah, uh, again, great question. And um, I, I think part of it is um, communication and, and, and sort of interaction, like collaborations, are, I think, are extremely useful. So um, they're not always easy to set up uh, for various reasons. Sometimes it's because of the industry partner. They have all kinds of requirements and makes it hard to interact with outsiders. Uh, sometimes it can be from, from the academic side as well. But, but whenever these collaborations happen, it's always... Um, it's e extremely useful. I, I think what academic labs have um, is, um, I, I think a lot of interesting ideas are coming from academia because there's a bit more breadth of research. I think in, in industry, so one, one, one issue that we have in industry sometimes is we have lots of resources and that's great, but then it also kind of forces us into a particular kind of research, right? Like, I have all of this compute, I need to use it. So I'm gonna do this very large scale things um, that are limiting in some way, and we're going to be less explorative, you know, going to explore less uh, interesting ideas. And um, I think the other thing is um, in industry, research can get, uh, can stagnate quickly just because usually there's the same group of people and, and you know, you, you kind of, like things uh, uh, collapse and we're kind of thinking about the same things and we're kind of trying the same thing. And what academia usually brings is like new ideas because there's always like new students, new ways of looking at a problem, um, new backgrounds that bring out new, you know, connections. Like if someone who has like a neuroscience background starts doing ML and has all these ideas, someone comes from statistical physics, someone comes from there and, and they bring all these new ideas and new ways of looking at things. So um, ideally I think, and that's really needed for the industry. and. You know, for us, like we, we just kind of need to communicate with you guys and, and, and figure out what you're thinking about and what you're thinking is the next exciting thing. And um, we can potentially help scale that up or, 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 or do things. But um, yeah, ideally collaborations. I don't know how easy they're to set up. I think uh, maybe more than often industries fall there being a bit strict on how to build these collaborations. But um, yeah, I think that's Thank what you, I Rizman. see. Thank yeah. you, Rizman, very much. And thank you for pointing out the strength of academic labs that have uh, students that are very diverse. I think our lab is an example of very diverse set of backgrounds of students coming to ML and I'm fortunate in that regard. I guess let's move now to Ari and Ari is um, a collaborator of us and a friend of our lab and has worked with numerous students in the lab on a variety of topics. So thank you Ari for making the time was, out of your for busy clinical, clinical time to, to to, to help us out. And what I want to ask you is, what do you think really real world impact of this work could be in healthcare specifically? And which of these methods you think will really be useful in healthcare? A, a, a great question. Um, and I, I wanna, see the problem is that it's very difficult to, I need to take away my own prejudices from this and my own interests, all right? So, so I used to be a physicist, so I have to say, you know, the neuroplast stuff was really interesting. Uh, and you know me that I, because of the way I work, I'm interested in physiological signals and time series. And so I think, you know, the counterfactual estimation type, anything that gets us towards causal inference, because there are huge problems with the, the current gold standard kind of methodologies that, that we have in healthcare. There, it's, it's such a high dimensional space, particularly when we start looking at uh, sort of treatment options and, and things that evolve over time that, you know, I think a sort of silver standard, some of these methods actually, you know, do offer huge potential. But I would say that because those are sort of my interests. I think what I was actually really struck by in, in the presentation, the really excellent presentations I've just watched, and these are these works that I haven't seen before, um, which I think was particularly important, is, the re is a recognition that there is a pipeline, okay? And I mean, you said at the beginning, Mahalo, one of the very interesting things about uh, medicine or healthcare, why it also may drive machine learning as well as being an interesting area, is because, as you know, the data is dirty. It has a complex structure within it. Um, we need to understand the data. I do 
actually quite like the, the you know the idea of, sort of data centric uncertainty as a, a method in the armamentarium because we need to know when we're looking at things that actually we're uncertain about. So starting at that with some really dirty data, we've got to then process it, do some clever modeling um, and, and inference from that. But at the other end as well, another really dirty area that's difficult, that is also rather difficult to explain, is, is, is the clinician behavior, because none of this will work. I mean, at the end of the day, so I'm a clinician, if we're going to do a healthcare project, ultimately, I guess what I'd like to do is make someone better at the end of it, somehow. Uh, and, and that's the effect or part of that is going to be the clinician. So we're going to have to work out how we actually influence people. And clinicians do not necessarily we talk a lot about the explainability of, of, of models. But actually, what is the explainability of the, of the people that are actually delivering the healthcare? That is also actually fairly black box as well, I, I would. It's maybe a slightly controversial position, but it, I, I'd say it's a black box too. So, so I think it's like, the pipeline. Uh, so, so you are referring to the work of Ali Han? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And done. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Um, let me move to the next question. So what can ML community in general, both academia and industry, do to enable adoption of these new ML tools in practice? And again, especially in healthcare, given the high barriers to entry? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, well, I mean, it's a, this is a difficult. The first question, I think, is you have to decide what, what game are you in, right? Uh, and I like to look at all of these. This is a translational thing, okay? So I like to look at this in, in the sort of NASA technology readiness levels. Are we in an early TRL kind of stage? In which case, actually, that's relatively straightforward, but it's difficult to be impactful. I think it then goes back to some of the things that Razvan said about publication and, and communication and so on. Let's think about the high TRL, you know, high technology readiness level, actually fit for patient kind of impact. Let's, let's do my, I, I want to make someone better. Part of it because that's the most difficult so if you're in that game i hate to say it but you have to do a trial and having just rubbish trials and saying that trials are problematic you have to do a trial because no one will accept anything without a trial uh, and uh, i mean there's recent decide ai guidelines that, that, that kind of sort of encapsulate this but basically you can think about this as a phase one phase two phase three phase four uh sort of pathway it, 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 or, or analogous to that kind of pathway but you have to do that and let's face it, you know, that, that, that's, that's a thing in itself. It costs a lot of money. One has to be obvious. So you need to pick your trial carefully, and I'll come back to that. You, and you need to pick your partner because you're going to need to go into a healthcare setting. I'm not going to say hospital, wherever it is. And you're going to need to get through the, the regulatory parts of this because there is no choice. You have to do this if it's going to be adopted in, in a healthcare setting, assuming that we're aiming to make people better, you know, patient-facing applications. Um, you need to think quite carefully about what that trial is going to be, because I did a trial uh, very recently of a, of a digital biomarker. It, you know, it's really hard work, but you don't want to do the wrong trial because you can easily get the wrong answer. You want to do something that is going to give you, you want to choose your endpoints carefully so that it actually brings you forwards. Um, you need to think very carefully because none of these things, none of these things work in themselves. Everything is going to be work as part of a system. And the variability in the system may dwarf the benefits of the thing that you see from the machine. So you need to think about the whole thing from end to end, which I guess it comes back to Rosvan's point earlier. It's about collaborations, but at this time it's about collaboration with people that are trialists and can get things into, into actual healthcare settings. And I'm afraid some money involved in that as well. But. Thank you very much, uh, Razvan and Ari. In view of time, I guess we will stop here. It's unfortunate, but uh, thank you both very, very much for joining us and all the food for thought. Uh, thanks, Mihaela, and I'd definitely like to like to echo those thanks. That was fantastic, and it's such a shame never to have more time. I feel like we could always go on for always go on for hours, and it would be great. Um, unfortunately, again, in the interests of time, um, everyone who posted questions on the Slack channel will do our very best to answer all of those on Slack. But unfortunately, we won't be able to take um, any of those live right now. Um, so in terms of future sessions for Inspiration Exchange, um, today's session will be put up on YouTube soon, probably in the next week. And then we'll be taking a break for summer before we're returning in September for a session on neural differential equations and all their applications. In order to stay up to date and hear about, uh, hear about both today's session when it goes on to YouTube, September session and all future sessions, 
Please do visit our dedicated page for Inspiration Exchange and sign up if you haven't done so already. And please do let any friends or colleagues who might be interested know. Finally, just a huge thank you to everybody, all of today's speakers, the panelists once again. And enjoy your summer, everybody. Thank you very much.